I think the best stories are sometimes sitting right in front of us. You know, you're looking elsewhere. The stories, the real stories, are mm. often just out the window. Yeah. Thanks for having us in your studio today. I have to admit, I've got a bit of studio envy, I think. This is a beautiful space. I think it's the best studio in Wellington, and it's mine. <laughs> How are you feeling? Have you worked out what you're going to draw yet? I've got a few thoughts, Toby. I've been looking at you, you know, and I thought, you know, because I'm big on life drawing. OK. And, I, and I'm thinking, maybe I could draw Toby, and that would be terribly meta. OK, that sounds cool. You might not agree with that when you see the drawing, but, you know. <laughs> Hey. No, that sounds it's a great idea. Yeah. I was thinking that I might, if this feels slightly cheeky in, in your company, but I was thinking that I might try and draw my version of Terry T.A. I'd be on. <laughs> uh, it's a character that's very near, near and dear to my hat. I'm glad I'm not drawing Terry because I had a go recently, you know, right. when it was reprinted and I'd forgotten how to draw the boy. Right. You know, okay. I just couldn't whittle up. You've moved on past, yeah. that, past that time. It was. That's interesting. Frightening, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So, Bob, people, lots of people my age will probably know you as a children's book writer and illustrator. Mm. Terry Teo series, uh, After the War. Um, but these days you're also sort of living in a more fine art kind of world as a, as a landscape painter. Yes. How do you introduce yourself when you introduce yourself to someone? Yeah, yes, what do you write on the, you know, occupation? I use just put artist. Or artist, artist writer, illustrator sometimes. Right. Yeah. yeah. If it was just one thing, the artist would be there. Right? Artist would do. Yeah covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? <laughs> have, you, have you always been an artist? You, were you a drawer as a kid? I was always, I always drew, and I, I mean, my earliest memories are of drawing. Yeah. Um, I, I was hopeless at anything else, you know? Maths, hopeless, you know, maths, science, even writing. I used to get the letters tangled up, so I thought I wasn't good at writing, and my parents used to say, Oh, he's good at drawing. And um, they'd show my drawings to people who came, you know, odd visitors who came on Sunday afternoon and sat in the front room and say, look at young Bobby's drawings. Right. You know, and so I felt yeah. rewarded for it. My, my son asked me the other day, why do you draw, Dad? Mm. And, uh, and I said, I'm just still trying to get approval from my parents. You know, right. It's a tragic mess in here. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a common thing. I, yeah. feel, like, I yeah. feel a bit of that. It's, it's something that, that yeah. That praise that you get as a kid is pretty, yes, pretty influential, I, I think. It makes a big difference. Were there certain things that you liked to draw as a kid? It was fairly banal, probably. My parents were Scottish and English. Right. You know, they came here after the war, uh, to quote a book title. And they had calendars of Scotland on the wall. Those were what I thought pictures were. Mm. So I copied them. Right. I could do a good sailing ship. Yeah. You know, pirates. And... I wasn't drawing what was out the window. Mm. And it's like, it's like with Christmas cards at Christmas time, you know, there was snow and holly and not the hooter car was blooming. It was, yeah. it was a sort of schizophrenic view of, of right. where I lived. Right. It took me a while to look out the window, you know. Right. And was there a point that you did, that you did shift to, to sort of looking out the window and, and drawing? It's pretty late, New probably. Yeah. I remember when our family shifted from Wellington here okay. to Tokoroa, because my dad got a job in the paper mill. We'd never been north of Raumati South, you know. Mm. This was an adventure. And I, um, I, saw, I saw a whole lot of new things, and I can still play that movie of the drive in the Austin 10 okay. in my mind, you yeah. know, the driving out of Tai Happy and seeing Mount Ruapehu with mm. the snow. Astonishing. Yeah. driving through the pine trees as you came into Tokoroa. So I drew lots of drawings of my memories of that journey and sent them back to me, Nana in Wellington. That was a way of processing the right. big change in our family. Yeah. That's my first memory of looking at the land I mm. lived in. 
So were you always viewing that you would you would have art as a career? When was it? When did it become a sort of a, a career option for you? <laughs> Again, pretty late in the day, Tokoro was a wealthy town in the 60s. Yeah, like a logging town, yeah. right? People earned huge money at the mill. Mm. And you left school as soon as you could and you went to work in the mill and you had a you know, brown manila envelope of money every week and you right. spent it in the pub. Fortunately, in my seventh form year, whatever year that is now, mm. um, a young art teacher arrived. Okay. M Mike Ward, he was later a Green MP, and he said, we've got to get you into art school. And I said, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and he told me about fi f Fine Arts Prelim, which was the exam, you had to do a portfolio. Okay. You know? And yeah. I passed by 153. You had to get over 150. Okay. I, scraped, I scraped it by three <laughs> marks. Okay. Yeah. You know, and was that for, was that for Elam? Was Elam, that, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. And it was my ticket out of town. Yeah. <laughs> and what was Elam like when you when you arrived there? Was that what's this what's the scene? It was it was lively. You know, yeah. there were these um, people who couldn't get jobs in art schools now because they're completely unqualified, like Colin McCann, <laughs> Gretchen Albrecht. Yeah. Oh, and, they're never to you know, those you know, because they're not they haven't got the bit of they haven't got a degree bigger than the degree they're teaching. And were you doing landscape paintings at that at that stage? Um, I was doing whatever Colin said. He famously put um, three boiled eggs in a saucer. Okay. And, um, you know, and, I mean, and got you to look at where the light fell on. This is really an egg, folks. Um, <laughs> you know, and where the shadow, where, okay. where the shadow was cast. Mm. And I, I was really, I thought, oh, I've come to art school to draw eggs. Draw boiled eggs. Oh, for Christ's sake. This. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was young and stupid and I told, I told him so. I yeah. Thought, oh, this is and he, he looked genuinely hurt. OK. And then, but then he said, um, oh, I want 35 paintings of this e these eggs to everyone in the class by the end of the, the week, please. OK. I think I got through 15. And he... Um, I discovered everything I needed to know. Mm. You know, some of my eggs floated out of the saucers, some of them sat in there like collapsing sponges. The, the saucer didn't sit on the table. Right. The shadow, you know. So the lesson, it the was, lesson a, was... It's an astonishing was lesson. Terry Teo, mm. for, for people my age, is, is a really iconic character. Is obviously, mm. you made three books, and, and, and since then there's been two different TV series, the 80s one and the recent yes, one. Yes, yes. Um, tell me the story of how Terry Teo came about. I was really lucky in that I was working with Stephen Ballantyne on Crackham. He was the editor and I was the technical editor. And at the end of the year, you know, you sort of think, oh, what next? And I, I can remember standing in the... Crackham office, and I, I sort of said almost randomly to Steve, uh, we, should do a, we should do a comic book, Steve. You know, without thinking about it. We were both Tintin fans. And, and Steve said, yeah, sort of like Tintin, but in the South Pacific. And I said, yeah. And that was the end of the planning meeting. You know, I said, oh, look, I'll draw the first page. And so I, I did. But then Steve said, oh, yeah, well, why don't we have Terry getting kidnapped? That would be good. We didn't know how Terry was going to... We'd had no plan. Accidentally, we turned out to be a really good combination, and I look back now and I think, crikey, I was lucky. Uh, and so I started drawing. The drawing was a bit wooden to start with. <laughs> I look back with embarrassment at some of it. And we just ploughed on. I, I, asked, I did show it to the editor at Collins and said, David Orworthy, and he mm. said, how about... We, we got up to the bit where Terry was kidnapped. He said, do you want to find out what happens? You'll have to publish it. <laughs> and he said, right. oh, oh, OK. okay. Yeah. And a, a year later, I rang him up again and said, oh, look, we finished. Do you remember that conversation about <laughs> publishing? No contracts or... No, it's no, just no, a, no It's just a sort of a yeah. handshake. Yes. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, not even a handshake. It was sort of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, we delivered it. It was published. Logan Brewer knocked on the door. Um, 
so like you know a bit later and said can we make a television series of it we were so naive i just assumed this is what happened you know mm. it, oh yeah okay <laughs> but anyway it was, it was great it was a mm. great ride it was a good way to start a career and the idea from the early stage was for it to be very deliberately kiwi like yes. for me as a kid i i loved that it was i felt like there weren't too many things that I came across that were really sort of Kiwi like that. We had, you know, That's like right. I think of the front lawn yes. albums and things like that. Yeah. But I remember reading those and the humour and the, yes. the the landscape and the characters, everything's very, very Kiwi, isn't it? And that's what we, we just wanted to do. We wanted to do that. We'd, we'd, offer, we'd look at Tintin as our guide, but it had to be set in the Raglan Motor Camp. Raglan Motor Camp was the inspiration. I was wondering where the, where the what well, the, I, I can the real I can literally remember being at the Raglan Motor Camp sometime. You know, when I was a long haired git with hair mm. down to here, um, seeing somebody get out a, a mower and mow the lawn in front of their caravan, and I thought, oh, oh what a culturally rich country we lived in. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> you know. amazing. Well, that's yeah. great. very cute. It's it's and we just wanted to do that. Mm. In all of the Terry books, there's a page where there's a landscape. There's sort of an aerial view of a landscape that almost acts as a map for the yes. events that are about to proceed. Yes. Uh, sort of a full page or a three-quarter page page drawing that's sort of where all the events of the story are going to take yes. place. I call them illustrations you can journey through. And I love, you know, if you're looking in a library and you see a kid following it with their finger, that's a quite thrilling to me. You know, that they... You, it's a world that you're really... Thin kids need a map, into. you know, I reckon. And so you can provide that illustrative map. And I love maps. A place doesn't exist if it's if you haven't got a land and survey map of it. <laughs> yeah, you have a map, map. I'm a bit thing. of a map nut. <laughs> yeah, where did that come from? Is that a, a sort of a childhood thing? Do you think? Or, like, well, it's interesting. Um, I think you know. I grew up for until I was ten, quite high up on Mount Victoria, just over there, um, and we could look down on the suburb of Haitata and mm. Kilburnie, and we could see the airport over there, you could see the tanker wharf there in Evans Bay, you'd see tankers coming sailing down and unloading, you'd see Bristol freighters taking off from the airport into Howling Southerlies. Mm. You could see the terrorists with snow on them up the other end of the harbour. Yeah. So yeah, you really I had a high viewpoint. Of, yeah. Maybe it's because I'm six foot six tall as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to say I look down on people, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I think that may be where it came from. Yeah, right? and then after the war has that same, a sort of a similar angle again where you're seeing seeing the landscape. And that book, I th thought, seems to sum up lots of your interests in that it's about the place, but it's also about history. So yes. that land and history really come together. Yeah, land and history and story. So I'm looking at the, those brushes there. You've got a, oh, you've got nice a range, you've got that huge one there. Yeah. Oh, so it seems enormous to me. But is that for getting the sort of broader broader background textures and then your smaller ones for the details, is that right? Yes. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, even look at that tip, you know, it's pretty, it's actually a better tip mm. than that. <laughs> so um, invariably if I end up, and it's the same with oil painting if I'm, if I'm ending up with a tiny brush going like this, it often means the painting's a failure. Um, if I've got a, a big brush that's this wide and I'm going swoosh, swoosh, swoosh on the, on the oil painting, and you pull back in time, you don't make that final mark to improve it and wreck the whole thing. It's knowing when to stop. <laughs> mm. I'm admiring all this stuff on the wall behind you there, these oh, yeah. reference photos. Yes. Is that... that the kind of the research process for the for the current thing you're working on and it's that dilemma of working off reference you know google images has, is really helpful in its rex drawing because look here i've got a little light table <laughs> and i'm i you know sometimes with historic with a historical drawing i mean here it was malta you want things to look accurate historically accurate so you're referencing you're using reference but you don't want to be a slave to that reference. There's something too about the um, 
the spirit of it too sometimes it's not a literal the literal yes. way that a street looks and the way that a street feels that's can right. be two completely different that's things. Right. And this book is this this is obviously another historical project. Is it do you want to tell me a bit about what it's about? Um, Are you allowed to say is it No 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 my my um, approach is to shoot my mouth off to everyone and then I feel I have obliged I'm obliged to do it. Actually it's right. Um, here, my dad's photograph album of his war. In, in the 30s and 40s, he went to sea. It's amazing you still have those and photos. And he wouldn't talk about anything that happened to him during the war, but he was really good at keeping his album. There he is, look. Wow. That's me dad. Amazing. That's incredible. And I, anyway, I realised I had all this material and we're all trying to process our parents, you know, mm. who have stuffed us up. I've, is it, the, I, it was a, a biography it was a story. from the, the, this book? Or Sorry, is it a biography of your dad, the book, or is it no, based on No, it's a ripping adventure. OK. You know, because his convoy duty was a, was a terrifying adventure that he never talked about. There's also a modern strand to it of two grandchildren going on a similar journey in a kayak. OK. Um, you know, and they're going to meet their grandfather. My... Grandfather, my dad's dad was in the was in the war as well, and yeah. also was one of that same generation, I guess, of guys that came back and never really talked no, about it too much. No. He was a um, he was a Lancaster pilot, Ooh, uh. um, and he, yeah, had some horrible experiences. Yes, got shot down twice and managed to managed to scrape through both times. But um, yeah, for me, that's a story that I that's always been sitting there, is thinking that I'd yes. love to to, yes. to, to to tell that story somehow. So I'm interested to know if that's do you feel like that's some, a, sort of a, a duty to, to pass that story on, or is that a, um, it's just a, a story that's that's personal to you that you want to share, or what's the? Where does I'd, that I'd like to. I'd like to. I'd like to, to, I'd like to um, give a whole lot of highfalutin motives to it, but actually, I'm just. Uh, um, <laughs> it's a very deep-seated thing. I have to. I have to get it out of the way to yeah. move on. Yeah. Like it's a processing it's thing. It's a processing as, thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he never talked about it. I'm making him talk about it. He's a bit dead at the moment and has been for many years. <laughs> so I'm in, I'm almost inventing a narrative for him. To, I'm asking the questions mm. with this that yeah. I didn't ask him in real life. Yeah. I might be making bits of it up. Although I've been able to find some really good there was actually a good description of um, of the convoy the one serious convoy he was on across the mid, and I have actually found some film footage of it, of oh, the ship he was on being bombed. Wow. <laughs> it, was in the, it was in the Imperial War Museum. I think the best stories are sometimes sitting right in front of us. This was mm. sitting in, on a suitca in a suitcase on top of the wardrobe for years. <laughs> right. And I think, you know, you were looking elsewhere. The stories, the real stories are mm. often just out the window. Yeah. To talking about your painting, it's predominantly landscapes, and are they are they real places that you remember? Are they places that you're imagining? Are they? Well, I mean, one example: Hazel and I were biking through um, Kurau. We saw the sign on a little museum that said "The Birthplace of New Zealand's Social Social Security System." Oh, what in Kurau? Okay. And there's a whole story about that. There were three three chaps. The locals called them the Three Wise Men. They designed uh, our um, a free health service for the workers. Right. It's, a, it's a really interesting story. Mm. So I've done a bunch of paintings about this because it was anchored in a place. Mm. Living in that, that sort of fine art world and, and the, the kids' books and the more sort of commercial art stuff, yeah. is, there a, is there a sort of a contrast between those two environments? I mean, people... It's almost like two <laughs> different languages to speak that, or something. Yeah, like yes, yes. Sort of, Oh, God, you know, you're going to get me into trouble with the fine arts people here. But they can be a bit snooty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what I really like about the children's book world is that it's collegial, mm. you know. Um, we're all very supportive of one another, and I think that goes back to people like Margaret Mahi and Joy Kelly and that. I remember going... I went to the Kids' Book Awards a couple of years ago and I remember coming away thinking, 
um, you know, I've been to advertising industry awards or media industry yes. awards, and the kids put awards. I just had the nicest night. I felt like everybody. Yes, that's right. I wanted to give them a hug. Everyone was really sweet and just really there was a lot of warmth in the in the yes, room. Yes, that's right. Does it come from a, the, a similar place for you? The, the sort of the, the fine art versus the, the commercial art. Is they are they different thought processes to to work on those things? No, I think it's all drawing. It's all just drawing for me. It's looking. Looking at things, you know, and trying to get them down on paper. I used to, um, I used to carry um, a sketchbook whenever I flew because I loved looking down on the landscape, you know. But occasionally I need to sharpen the pencil, so I'd whip out. And this is not the thing to carry on. Can't do this no, anymore. No, bad. <laughs> <laughs> I got into trouble. <laughs> You know, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> You ready to see these pictures? Should we, should we no, 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 I don't think we should do that, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Terry. Oh, look at that. Look at this. This is, oh, this is great. This is you. That's beautiful. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, great. Here I go. Yes, our boy. There he is. <laughs> Excellent. Do you feel like that when you see Terry too? You feel, feel like he's your... He's oh, I love... I love yeah. Our cycle home past the Waitangi Skate Park, and I mm. just watch those... You know, those young women and the men on their skateboards, and I think they're, it's ballet, they're balletic, mm. they're, they're um, yeah. astonishing. Yeah. You know, so hey, one question yeah. I had, uh, that occurred to me just as I, was, as I was drawing this is the question is sort of ambiguous in the books, Terry's ethnicity, right? Is he Māori in the books or in the TV shows they had sort of Māori yeah, yeah, actors playing? I thought you might ask that. I mean, his dad's clearly English. Mm. Um, his name's Terry Teo. Um, Polynesian kids would rush up to me at school and say, hey, thanks for making them Polynesian. Maori kids would say, thanks for making them Maori. Japanese would, kids, kids would come up and say, hey, Tio, good Japanese name. You know, um, Steve and I are still trying to work out his exact ethnicity. Right. We'll keep you posted on yeah. that one. He's a, you know, he's a Kiwi. <laughs> yes, he's somewhere yeah. south of the equator. Yeah. And we wanted him, uh, he's South Auckland. Mm. He's South Auckland. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much for chatting today. That was an absolute pleasure. It was really, really cool to cool to talk. It's and, been fun and cool to draw together. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.